Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermons Podcast. After the message, check out Postscript, a new weekly follow-up to the sermons at FaithBridge. Find it online on our website or on iTunes by searching FaithBridge Postscript. Now, let's join in on today's sermon. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? All right, well... Uh, My name is Timothy Atik. I've gotten to be here with you before, but I just want to say it's great to be back at Faithbridge. I hope that all is well here. When I was a freshman in high school, uh, there were two things that I desperately wanted. Number one, I wanted a girlfriend, and number two, I wanted a Jeep that I could drive off-road because that's what was cool at my high school among the guys. The cool thing was to have a truck that was jacked up with big tires and a winch on the front of it so you could go drive it off-road or run over the curb, I don't know. Um, But if you drove up to my high school, it looked like every day there was a four-wheel drive convention going on, and so I wanted to be a part of that convention. Unfortunately, I didn't get either of the two things I wanted. I didn't get a girlfriend, (laughs) and I didn't get an off-roading Jeep. The good news is that I had a friend who had a ranch, and on that ranch was an off-roading Jeep. Uh, So my friend and I, we would go out to his ranch, and we would hop in this Jeep that didn't have any doors, and it didn't have a cover on it. I'm sure my parents loved that. But we would, these two guys who didn't have driver's licenses, we were just ninth grade kids in the midst of puberty, Uh, we would hop in this Jeep, And we would just drive around patrolling for mud. And any time we would find mud, what we would do is we would floor it, we would hit the mud, we would do a couple of donuts, mud would fly everywhere. In uh, in the midst of that, we would take off our shirts, we would high five each other, our voices would crack, and then we would just do that (laughs) all over again. That's... I don't know why I couldn't get a girlfriend. I really don't. (laughs) Um, But I'll never forget this one time. uh, We were out on the ranch, and I don't remember who was driving, but we found this really nice patch of mud, and so we did what we needed to do. We floored it toward the mud. We hit the mud. Uh, We did one donut. We did another one. We did another one, and then our Jeep just stopped, and it sank. And that wasn't very cool when you're a ninth grader. It's like the fun just ended. And uh, we didn't know what we were doing, and so we just decided, we assumed that if you wanted to get out of the mud, all you had to do was push the gas harder. So we did that, and the tires would just spin, and we would just sink more. See, the problem was that there was no more traction. We couldn't get any more traction. The tires would just spin. So we had to make this long walk up back to the ranch house, and uh, we told my friend's dad what happened. He looked at us. He was not very surprised. Uh, And what he did, what he had to do, was he hopped in the ranch's tractor. He came driving down the hill to pull us out. And I'll never forget this. I grew up in the middle of Dallas, and so whenever I stepped out of the city, things like tractors were like a phenomenon to me because all I saw was city life. And I will never forget being mesmerized as I watched my friend's dad drive this tractor down the hill. Some of y'all are like, you need to get out of town more. (laughs) But follow me on this. I'll never forget watching the tractor drive down the hill. And then my friend's dad didn't even think about driving into the mud. He just drove the tractor effortlessly through the mud that we had been stuck in. And I will never forget watching these huge, massive tractor tires just effortlessly grip the mud with traction. We attached some tow straps to the tractor to our Jeep. He ended up uh, towing us out, and we went back to our fun in the midst of the puberty years. As I think about that story, and the reason that I even share that experience with you this morning is that I think that that is a beautiful picture of what our relationships with God can look like on any given day. 
I would imagine that that scenario probably describes the relationship with God that many people in this room have. See, here's what it can look like walking with God. For a season of time, you go out and you do spiritual donuts with God where you enjoy your relationship with Jesus and everything is going well and then you reach this point where you just get stuck. And you wanna go somewhere, you wanna grow, you wanna be consistent. You wanna enjoy God, you don't want it to feel like an obligation, but the tires just kind of spin. And you can't seem to get any traction. And so you just get stuck, whether it's for a day or for a week or a month or even for a year. And what ends up happening is we come to church and and a church service becomes the tractor that kind of hooks up to our lives and the tractor kind of pulls us out. And we go back to doing some spiritual donuts for a week or for a month and, and everything is great with Jesus and then we just find ourselves stuck again. And then Jesus Calling or the latest book becomes the tractor that kind of hooks up and it pulls us out. And then we just start the cycle all over again. And if we were to kind of weigh things out, our, our relationships with God are more inconsistent than consistent. They're more obligation than enjoyment. And I just don't think that that's how God intended it to be. What if it's possible for us to develop some tractor-sized spiritual treads so that we're not reliant on some church service, although church services are great, and I believe strongly in what we're doing here this morning, but our lives aren't dependent upon what happens in this room this morning, and our lives aren't dependent upon some author producing the latest book. Our lives aren't con- uh, dependent upon some conference. No, what if God was able to develop some tractor-sized spiritual tread so that if we want to go somewhere with the Lord consistently, we're able to because there's traction. Can you imagine a life where you're more consistent than inconsistent? Can you imagine a life with God where there's more enjoyment than obligation? What if that's actually possible? If you're in that place this morning, if you're sitting there saying, yeah, I I do feel stuck a lot more than I feel like I'm actually going somewhere. If you're sitting here this morning saying, yes, I do want to go somewhere. Yes, I have that desire. I'm ready to grow. I I would love to have a relationship with God where I can actually experience this increasing levels of enjoyment with God. If that's you, then I want you to hear what I'm about to say right now. I want to share with you the single greatest truth that has transformed the way that I relate to the God of the universe. And I hope you just hear what I just said. I'm going to share with you the single greatest truth that has transformed the way that I walk with God. And I believe that it will transform the way you walk with God. One of my mentors, his name's Doug Sherman. I'll never forget him telling me this short phrase of truth, and it's made all the difference, and here it is. Don't miss it. My view of God determines my response to God. That's it. I'm going to say it again. My view of God determines my response to God. Here's what that means. If I want to have a big response to God, meaning if, if I want to have this increasing passion for Jesus, if I want to have an increasing desire to read the word of God and to spend time in prayer, if I want to have this increasing uh, big response to God, it's first going to start with a big view of God. On the other hand, if I have a small response to God, if there's apathy, if there's inconsistency, if there's a lack of desire, if there's a small response, we can be confident that it's because there's first a small view of God. So if you want a big response to God, you have to have a big view of God. And if you have a small response to God, you can be confident it's because you first have a small view of God. This is how relationships work. This is how any of our relationships work. I mean, all you have to do is go look at an engaged couple to notice this. Think about it. The man in an engaged relationship 
will do anything for that woman, right? I mean, he will watch any Nicholas Sparks movie. (laughs) He won't think twice about spending hours at the mall. I mean, he will reach the 30-minute marker at the mall where most guys have mall fatigue set in, and he'll just blow right past it. He will go to Walgreens and buy feminine hygiene products. I mean, proudly. I mean, he just, he won't even think twice about it. Why? Because he has a big view of that woman. But just go be a fly on the wall of the office of a marriage counselor, and you will hear story after story of two people who have small responses to each other because they have small views of each other. See, this is how our relationships work, and this is how our relationship with God works. What that means is tomorrow morning when you wake up, if you have no desire to interact with God, most likely it's because the God you are interacting with or the God you are relating to in that moment is a God that's really not worth relating to. Your God in that moment is so boring, so distant, so disappointed in you, so irrelevant and so incompetent that no one would want to relate to him in that moment. Here's something interesting to think about. When you interact with God at any given moment, what do you picture his posture to be towards you at that moment? Do you picture God's posture towards you as one like this or like this? No one wants to relate to a God who's constantly disappointed in them. No one does. Tomorrow when you get up and go to work, if you let anxiety and worry control your life, most likely it's because your God in that moment isn't a God who can truly step in and bring peace. If you go out into the world tomorrow and you try and tackle life all on your own, most likely it's because the God in your life in that moment is not a God who can step in and rule and reign over all things. So your view of God will determine your response to God. And here's the interesting thing. This is why so many of us spend so many years walking in inconsistency. Is because when we have those mornings, those weeks, those months where we spend little to no time interacting with God, we believe that the only thing that needs to change is our response. And so what we will do is we will make commitments to change our responses to God. So this is what we will do. When we feel dry or spiritually frustrated, we just make commitments to be more responsive. So we say, okay, uh, God, I'm going to read commit to getting up earlier and reading my Bible more, and I want to commit to praying more, and I want to commit to staying away from these certain sins, and here's this commitment and this commitment. And so what will happen is that we will make these new commitments. We might even write them down in our journal. We might even tell a friend. And so we'll fulfill our commitments for a day or for a week and for the really spiritual here for a month or even for a few months or even a year, but eventually we'll cave on our commitments and the cycle will start over. All, it'll just start over again. See, I think we're making the wrong commitments because when all you do is change your response to God without first adjusting the view of God, that's what happens. What if your main commitment was this? My goal is to fight for the biggest view of God possible every single day of my life. Because a big view will drive a big response. I have here a balloon, and I'm going to attempt to inflate this balloon on stage. I do get frightened at the idea of blowing up a balloon in front of a bunch of people because I just think, what if it doesn't happen? What if I can't reach down deep and bring what I need to to inflate this thing? I'm going to attempt to do it. God help me. Thank you, Jesus. Here we go. I'm really about to blow some people's minds. Not really. This here, stating the obvious, is an inflated balloon. Um, It takes 
Now, please follow me on this, okay? I, I understand no one's going to hear this and be like, oh, a balloon, I get it. I met Jesus when he inflated the balloon. Thank you, God. For, one day I was at church, the pastor inflated a balloon. Thank you, Jesus. No, that's not going to happen, all right? It takes focus and intentionality to inflate a balloon. It really does. It takes focus and intentionality to inflate a balloon. And the reason I've inflated this balloon is I want you to be clear, your view of God is just like this balloon. It takes focus and intentionality to inflate your view of God. And the good news is that where there's an inflated view of God, there's going to be an inflated response to God. There'll be inflated passion, inflated desire, and that's a good thing. But here's the thing. It doesn't take much to deflate, a, to deflate a balloon or to deflate your view of God. And here's the thing, where there's passivity in your view of God, there will be a deflated view and response toward God. You need to know your view of God right now is either inflating or deflating. Most of us in this room right now, whether we admit it or not, our view of God is like this right now because we've been spending all of our time focusing on the response. I hope that you will hear what I'm going to say right now. Your view of God right now, in this moment, is either inflating because of intentionality or deflating because of passivity. This is the proper rhythm of a growing, vibrant relationship with God. If you want an inflated view of God, there's worship, then response. That's the rhythm of life. Worship, then response. Worship of who God is, what he's like, and what he's done. Response in light of who he is, what he's like, and what he's done. But where there is response without worship, there's dryness and frustration. That's how it works. So here's what I want to do this morning. I just want us to open up the word of God and I want us to spend some time worshiping together, inflating our view of God so that we can walk out those doors today with an inflated response to God, all right? So if you have a Bible, I want you to just turn with me to page one, Genesis chapter one, verse one. If you don't have a Bible, you can just slip up your hands. One of the ushers will pass you a Bible. Now's a good time for me to remind you about postscripts. If at any point during the talk you have questions or comments uh, for us to address in the postscripts, then if you look in your bulletin, it'll give you uh, information on how to do that. I hope that you know that, that this book it's not an instruction manual. This book is a worship manual. This book is primarily about who God is, what he's like, and what he's done. It's not primarily about what we need to do. This is a worship manual. So in terms of where we should start this morning, we could honestly open it up to any page and learn about who God is, what he's like, and what he's done so we could worship and then respond in light of our worship. But I just figure we'll open up to page one and just start reading. Here we go, verse one it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's go ahead and stop there because that's a verse that we could honestly spend weeks unpacking. What a monumental, uh, significant verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very powerful verse. I love what this tells us. It tells us this. Someone deserves credit for the masterpiece that is the universe. The Bible gives all credit to God. God is the creator of the universe. Is that who you think about when you pray and when you read the word? Do you realize that when you're praying, you're actually talking and you have the ear of the God who put the stars into place? He hung the planets. He put them where they are. He's the one who spoke mountains in oceans into creation. That's the God who's listening when you pray. When you read this book, the God talking to you. 
is the one who invented all things. Isn't that amazing? We have a God that big, yet he's so small that he can be personal to us, and he wants us to call him Father. He doesn't want to be some distant, distant, abstract substance way off in the sky. No, he wants to be so close, so big, yet so small that we can call him Father, and he can call us child. That's good news. That's the God that we're interacting with. Let's talk about this verse a little bit more. It says, in the beginning, God. And I love that because what that tells us is that before there was a beginning, there was a God. You know why? Because God has no beginning. God, ha- God is a creator, but he's never been a creation. He's in charge of all of creation, but he himself has never been a creation because he only is creator, his existence is limitless. He has no beginning and he has no end, which is kind of cool to think about. The God that we get to interact with, the God that we have access to through faith in Jesus Christ is a God whose attributes are limitless. His existence is limitless, but not just that. Everything about him is limitless. Have you ever thought about that, that the God of the universe has limitless love Limitless passion, limitless wisdom, limitless knowledge, limitless power, limitless grace, limitless forgiveness. Everything about him is limitless. Imagine that's the God that you have access to at any moment of every day. You know what that means? Think about the implications of this. When, when you screw up, when you blow it in life, God knows about it because he has limitless knowledge. His presence is limitless. He knows about it, and that's kind of a, that's a scary thought, but the good news is that you don't have to run from him because you can't, you can run to him, why? Because his grace, his love, and his forgiveness for you in this moment is limitless. Like you can't step outside the boundaries of his love because there are no boundaries to it. Think about the fact that you have access to a God who has limitless wisdom and knowledge, and he wants to make it accessible to you all day long when you're stepping into a meeting, when you have to make a big decision. He wants to give you access to his limitless knowledge. I have two kids. I'm about four years into the whole parenting thing, and I want to give you my definition for parenting. Okay, as an expert, four years in, (laughs) I believe that this is a perfect definition for parenting. This is what it means to parent. It means that you will spend your lifetime having to make split-second decisions when you have no clue what you're doing. (laughs) That's what parenting is. It's a lifelong process of making split-second decisions in situations where you have no clue what you're doing. So even, I mean, this happens all the time in our household, but a few weeks ago, we were, uh, we were in a, a potty training crisis, and I'm not going to share all the details. If you want the extended version, come up afterward. If you want to fast from lunch, I can help you do that with this story, but... Um, we were, it, it was just, it was, it was meltdown central in our household, and I was looking at all the options before me. I mean, this was big time crisis in our household, and I was looking at all the options, and there were no good options. All of the options were awful. So I was like, okay, if I do that and say that, it'll cause a meltdown there. And if I say that and do that, well, there'll be a meltdown. And if I say and do that, our house will implode. Like the structure itself will implode along with our entire family. That's what was going on in our household, I kid you not. And so I just began to talk to God. Well, because he has limitless knowledge and wisdom, so he even knows about potty training. And so I said, God, I know that you have limitless wisdom and knowledge. I need you to download some of that. Like, I need you to give me access because my finite mind, I cannot get my mind around this situation to avoid meltdown, all right? God, I just need you to tell me which option will cause the least 
amount of meltdown. And so as I'm talking to God, it's as if he just stepped in and says, yeah, why don't you just say this one thing? So I said this one thing in this situation, and it solved everything. You might be like, yeah, whatever. No, it really, like, you remember Full House, the TV show, those episodes where it was like, 28 minutes of conflict and problem, and then just in a second, 30 seconds, they say they're sorry, things resolve, the keyboardist plays music, and the episode ends, like in 30 seconds, wrapped up perfect. That's what happened in my household. I said one thing, and the entire thing was solved, and my wife and I, we were looking at each other like, thank you, Jesus. I mean, I don't know what to say besides... Like this was, this was truly a crisis for our family. It wasn't just a small deal that I've turned into a big deal. No, this was a, a, a big deal and God showed up with his limitless wisdom because he wanted to give us access to it. And that's the God that we have access to at any moment of every day when you're having to make critical decisions, when you're having to walk through different conversations, do you realize that the God of limitless wisdom and knowledge wants to be there for you. Not in a passive way, but in an active way. Is that the God that you're relating to at any given moment? I mean, we're, we're moving through Genesis 1 at lightning speed. I mean, we've already covered verse 1. Let's move on to verse 2. It says this. We're just going to get through the whole Bible this morning, so just get comfortable. says this, the earth, I love this verse. This is pretty incredible what it's going to tell us about God. It says this, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of, over the face of the waters. It tells us what God started out with. When he created all things, he started out with nothing. God made something out of nothing. What this verse tells us is that the God that we know is a God who has limitless creativity, so much creativity that he can take nothing and turn it into something. He didn't do like an extreme home makeover universe edition where he had all of the right raw materials. He just had to put them together. It wasn't the type of deal where he got a universe, universe kit and it just required assembly. God started with nothing and turned it into something. And that's the only time in the history of mankind where that has happened. I don't know if you realize this, but this is the only time where originality has happened. God is the only one who's truly original. When man invents or creates anything, he's not being original. Man only has the ability to create something out of something. Man is only able to create or invent when inspired by someone or something else. That's how it works. The invention of the airplane, that wasn't an original work. That basically, the airplane just made it possible for humans to fly like birds do. Artificial light is a knockoff of natural light. The printing press didn't make copying documents possible. It just made it efficient. See, that's what human beings are able to do. Create something out of something. Be inspired by someone or something else. But God had no one or nothing else to inspire him. He had nothing to work with. He started with nothing and turned it into something. His only inspiration was himself. He has limitless creativity, and this is good news for us. You know what that means? It means the God who invented you is the God who has limitless creativity. The God who has mapped out every moment of every day of your life is the God who has limitless creativity. Why would you ever want to be in control of your life when a God who has limitless creativity is offering to lead the way. I firmly believe that our lives only become mediocre when we insist on doing things our own way. God is incapable of crafting a mediocre existence. It is completely contrary to his nature because there's nothing mediocre about God. 
but it's incredibly difficult for us to wake up in the morning and to pray the prayer, God, have your way with me today. If our God in that moment is so boring, so irrelevant, and so uh, incompetent to do anything with our lives, if that's who our God is in that moment, it's gonna be impossible for us to pray, God, have your way with me. But when you wake up, And you inflate your view of God and you say, wait, God, you're the one who created something out of nothing. You're the one who has mapped out every moment of my life. God, guard me from ever taking control of my life. You're the one who I want to be in control. God, you do whatever you want with me today because what you're going to do with me is far better than anything I could ever do with or for myself. Have your way with me. That's the God we worship, a God with limitless creativity. Is that the God that you relate to at any given moment of any day? Let's move on, verse three. Says this, it's a short verse, but pay attention to the wording. Says, and God said, here's what he says, let there be light, and what happens? And there was light. Isn't that powerful? God speaks and something magnificent happens. God just says the word and the impossible happens. What's light? Well, no one knows because it's never existed before. But you know what? Let there be light. Boom. Oh, that's what light is. Something that illuminates the entire universe. God speaks, God says the word, and magnificent, impossible things happen. Is this the God that you relate to any moment of any day? A God who just has to say the word and the impossible happens in your life. When there's drama in your life, when there's things going on that is causing you worry and anxiety, frustration and anger towards other people in your life, do you look to God and say, God, just say the word, knowing that he's a God who has limitless power and he's able to flood your life with peace in that moment? When there's someone sick in your life, when you don't have a job, when things are not financially secure, you looking at God saying, God, all you have to do is say the word. You are that powerful. You're a God who can say the word and the impossible will happen here. I don't know if it will, but I trust that whatever you want to do is going to be the best thing because God, you're a God who just has to say the word. When you're struggling in life, when something's broken in your life, when you keep running back to the same struggle, the same sin over and over and over, do you believe that there's a God with limitless power who just has to say the word and he can prompt healing in your life? I'll just be honest with you. I tend to be more of a there's just no way type of person. I spend a lot of my time looking at God saying, God, there's just no way. What I've found is that being a realistic person makes me a spiritually pessimistic person. I would imagine that's what, uh, how many of you are here, that being a realistic person makes you a spiritually pessimistic person. So you might look at God in different scenarios where things seem impossible and you look at him and just say, God, there's just no way. God is a God who just has to say the word. I love the story in Matthew chapter eight. Listen to what it says. It's a great example of what we're talking about here. If you were to go read the rest of Genesis chapter one, you would see that everything God creates, he just speaks it into being because he's a God who just says the word and the impossible happens. Now we get to Matthew chapter eight says this in verse five, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, that means begging him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. So here's the scenario, in case you missed it. A centurion comes to Jesus saying, hey, my servant is paralyzed, suffering terribly at home. And Jesus says, fine, I'm going to come to your home to heal him. 
Look at what the centurion's response is in verse eight. He says this, the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Verse 13 tells us this, and to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. Why? Because God is a God who just has to say the word, and this centurion knows that. This centurion has a big view of God, so he has a big response to God. His prayer life is great. He comes to Jesus praying, appealing, saying, God, just say the word and healing can happen. This has everything to do with your prayer life. If you struggle to pray, if, if prayer feels really mundane to you, if it feels like a formality, something that you do but don't want to do, I would imagine that you're coming to God with your worries and anxieties, just saying, God, there's just no way. Imagine how your prayer life would shift if you really began to believe that the God you're talking to is a God who just has to say the word and the impossible can happen. Our God has limitless power, so much power that all he has to do is say the word. Just want to show you one more thing before uh, we finish today. If you were to go and read Genesis chapter 1, the very first verse, as we've already read, makes a huge statement, and it basically tells us that God created everything. What's the definition of everything? Everything. It's everything, okay? That's how you define everything. You define everything with everything. God created everything. And then if you were to go read the rest of the chapter, it fills in all the specifics. So God created the sun and the moon. He put the stars into place. He created the mountains and the seas. He put animals, creatures in the oceans, in the seas. He put animals and creatures uh, on, on dry land. He created everything, Paul tells this, tells us this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, about creation. Very important verse. Don't miss what it says. It says this, For the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Do you, do you know what Paul's saying there? He's saying that creation doesn't just point it creation doesn't just point to a creator. Creation tells us what the creator is like. So if you want to know what God is like, all you have to do is look at creation and all you have to do is look around this room. When you go to the ocean, when you stand on the beach and you see that the ocean appears to be limitless in three different directions, that is a declaration to us. That's what God's love and power and wisdom and creativity must be like. It must be limitless like the ocean. When you ride up a ski lift, if you've ever been skiing, if you know what I'm talking about, in front of you, all you see is an up-close shot of the mountain, and you see people falling all over the place. But if you were to take the time to turn around, can you envision the view behind you? You know what I'm talking about if you've ever been skiing, where you turn around, and all you see is this beautiful view of mountains, and it's so gorgeous that you will put your ski poles under your thigh, and you'll bite off your glove, and you'll fish around for your camera because you want to capture the beauty that's behind here. Imagine what people will do when they behold God's beauty in heaven for the first time. Think about the laughs that are in this room. Can you imagine what God's laugh must be like? It must be so contagious. It's the kind of laugh that we don't even have to hear the joke. We just hear the laugh and we are gasping for air because his laugh will be so contagious. If you think about how hilarious some people in this room are, imagine how hilarious God must be. He must be the king of all comedy because he's that hilarious. You think about how captivating sharks are that will watch them for a week? <laughs> Imagine how captivating God must be. You think about how pleasant sunny and 75 is with a slight breeze. Can you even imagine that here in spring? You remember what sunny and 75 with a slight breeze feels like? Walk outside, it's like standing in front of a blowtorch. I mean, we can't imagine that. 
But when you experience sunny and 75 with a slight breeze, that's God's way of communicating to you. You can't imagine just how pleasant my presence is. You think about how complex the human eye is. You think about how complex DNA is. You think about the fact that there's 228 distinct muscles just in the head of a caterpillar. You think about the fact that there's 3,000 different species of trees in one square mile of the Amazon rainforest. You can't imagine how complex God truly is. If you ever get to a point where you're bored with God, it's because you've bought into a lie that you've discovered everything there is to know about God and you've ceased to be impressed. You can't begin to imagine how impressive God is. You know what the good news is? We've read three verses of the Bible. There's still 65 more books and 49 more chapters all about who God is, what he's like, and what he's done. You know what this tells us? If you walk out of here and you find your response to God being very small, it's because you have a small view of God. And if you have a small view of God, what that tells you is that you're not even relating to the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is big. Imagine that. What if the God that you relate to any moment of any day isn't even a real God because it's some made-up God in your mind. It's nothing like the God of the Bible. That the God of the Bible is big. When you worship the big God of the Bible, you will have a big response to the God of the Bible because your view of God determines your response to God. The good news is that this big God is the God who wants a relationship with each one of us. That relationship is found only through realizing who Jesus Christ is and what he's done through his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. That relationship with the creator of the universe, it only comes through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. As you leave this morning, I hope you leave thinking of this balloon because your view of God, when you hit those doors, it's either going to be inflating because of intentionality or it's going to be deflating because of passivity. But mark my word, your view of God will determine your response to God today. So may we be people who go out and live big lives because we know we have a big God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that through knowing you, we have access to the one who created all things. And we just declare, Lord God, that you are a God who is truly limitless. You're limitless in wisdom and knowledge. You're limitless in creativity and power. God, you're beautiful, you are captivating, you are complex, you're pleasant to be around. Forgive us for all of the times we will spend even today relating to a small God. Pray that today you would just blow up our views of you. Give us a big view of you so that we can have a big response to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.